Please welcome Fox News anchor John Scott for a fireside chat with U.S. Army veteran, business owner, and nonprofit leader Tom Deerline. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I've been to a number of these conferences. I always meet fascinating people, and uh, I just really enjoy being here, as I have many, many years. Major Tom Deerline is our guest today, and he's got quite an interesting story, and I, I think you're going to enjoy hearing it because he always tells it well uh, also. I'm John Scott. Um, been at Fox News for a long time, and uh, well, I hope I get invited back here next year. So uh, let's just launch into it. Tom, you grew up in White Plains, New York, uh, received an appointment to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. So you're at West Point four years, five years in the Army after that, and then what? So I, uh, am I on? Am I good? So I, I, was, uh, I went infantry, airborne, ranger, took me three tries. Any third time, three timers out there? Like we saw up some, some real badasses on here this morning. It took me three times to get through ranger school. Got to the Berlin Brigade. Um, had a great three years and, and I enjoyed being in the military, but it, it was never what I wanted to do for a living. Oddly, when I was 13, I was like, I want to go to West Point. You know, my father was a China Marine at the end of World War II. My oldest sister, I'm one of nine, was a naval nurse. And I went up to a West Point football game, and I was like, I want to go there, and then I'll go in the military for five years, and then I'll get out. And that's what I did. I was 26 and living the plan of a 13-year-old boy, <laughs> and I had no idea what I wanted to do, um, but I ended up in corporate America for a little while. All right, so you're in corporate America working for a, a large corporation at first and then kind of downsizing as you went through your career, right? Yeah, so I started uh, in 1993 working for Johnson & Johnson, at the time the most admired company in America. And, you know, I really thought it was mail room to boardroom, and I thought that I'd end up in the senior ranks of J&J &J in 25 or 30 years. but. That's not the way really a lot of people build careers, even, even back then. Um, and I got a call to sell software at a smaller company, and I went to that. Guy that I met there went to a, a company um, called the Internet. I was like, what's the Internet? You know, people were still using AOL for dial-up. So I became part of the dot-com at a startup. Um, and during that time, I worked on my MBA at night and on weekends. And then I did, I went to a pure startup. I was employee number seven. And from 2000 to 2005, I was helping build uh, a dot-com company. All right, so you were out of the military for about a dozen years, 38 years old, and tell everybody what happened that one day. I got called back in. <laughs> where, where, are, where are the military folks? How many military folks in the room still know this? For the, all right, so for the civilians, um, IRR, Individual Ready Reserve. Now, I did know that I was in the Individual Ready Reserve. Like, I was using my little pink military ID card to get, like, discounts at Holiday Inn. Like, I, I, got, I went and played golf at the Coronado Golf. Oh, you're, you in the military? Yes, I am. Uh, but I didn't know yes, I am meant yes, you can call me. So I, I got back from business trip. I literally dropped my bag. I had golf bag and there was a Western Union pinned to the door of my apartment on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And like, I don't say that, think this is the cause, but like Western Union got out of the messaging business right after this. But I opened it up and it was from St. Louis. Where are my military folks? Not good when you get a note from St. Louis. So then I thought, oh, they got the wrong guy. You know, no big deal, I'll just call this 800 number. No, we got the right guy. So it was like right out of Abbott and Costello, who's on first, right? I'm like, 
Deer Line, Delta, Echo, India, and they're like, yeah. I go, 38. They go, yeah, you know, I go, I can't see my back. I got a beer belt. The guy, I, I don't know what the other, he like thought I was Forrest Gump, like I was so slow. He's like, yes, and you better be at Fort Jackson on 11 November. And so I went. <laughs> okay, you, you also got married before you went back in, right? Okay, so you, you get married, you report to Fort Jackson as a lieutenant or a captain at that point? As a captain, okay. um, but again, they don't promote you in the individual ready reserve. It turns out if you're hanging out on your couch, you don't get points <laughs> for watching Seinfeld. So uh, I got back in and I'm a captain, but if you think about year group 89, which is when I started in the military, they were all lieutenant colonels and battalion commanders. And I was like, had to go back in uh, as, as a captain, which, you know, it all worked out okay. It worked out okay, except you find yourself getting shipped off to Iraq in civil affairs. And what was what was your MOS? What what, what were what were you supposed to do? Hopefully, somebody else, is it fifty six Alpha or fifty eight Alpha? I don't know the MOS, but yeah, it was, it was civil affairs. So what had happened with this call up out of the Individual Ready Reserve? All the regular Army units had already rotated in. Right, the, the war is really in force starting in two thousand three. 2004, 2005, like, so they've rotated in all the National Guard units, they've rotated in all the reserve units, they've rotated in all the regular army units, so they needed bodies. And if you were trying to deploy a National Guard unit by law, you couldn't redeploy them for two years. Well, where do we find these doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs? Let's go find them on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, apparently. Even if they're 38. Yeah, and can't see, and I, could, I couldn't do one pull-up, it was not... It was not a good, good welcome back. I was talking to John in the back and he's like, what did you, where did you go? What did you do? I go, well, I went to the gym, I'll tell you that. Cause I knew they weren't calling me up to like go to Philly. Um, so I wanted to get back in shape and, but yeah, it, it, it was a bit of a shock to the system, but I definitely knew I was heading to Baghdad. Uh, when I got to Fort Bragg and went to, through civil affairs training. So technically I'm so calm but literally just technically, because civil affairs, you're, you're not kicking down doors and chasing bad guys. Um, you know, when we got to Fort Bragg, you know, we, we, it was mostly Iraq, but then Afghanistan. So they almost split that group of us, and there were 60 of us, and I think 20 of the 60 ended up in Afghanistan, and the rest of us ended up in various places in Iraq. And you were trying to help the Iraqis you know, on a local government level, just make life better, right? That was essentially your, your role. Yeah, I mean, uh, civil affairs, is, is, it's in the word, civilians. So your job was really to help the non-combatants and your missions were economic development, governance. Like I was a, an executive coach for the newly elected mayor of Sadr City, uh, humanitarian aid, um, and then what uh, General Petraeus made famous, sweat MS, essential services, sewage, water, electricity, trash, medical and school systems. So we were A, trying to rebuild that up, but you can't just rebuild it up and hand it off. What you're really focused on is giving the Iraqi people and the Iraqi organizations and the local Iraqis the capability and capacity to re-stand up their economy, their society, their schools, their hospitals. And so, again, I wasn't kicking down doors and chasing bad guys. I was doing a lot of humanitarian aid and what people would classically call reconstruction. We were rebuilding firehouses. We were rebuilding schools. We were rebuilding hospitals, things like that. So even though you're trying to do good things uh, for the Iraqi people, the insurgents didn't know that. Uh, well, no, they knew it, but they didn't want you to get credit, right? Like, people talk about, you know, Iraq or America or Sunni and Shia. It's almost like, it's almost like Gangs of New York. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but it really, it really was just these small folks that were trying to control neighborhoods or areas, and they were thriving in the, in the chaos. Mm -hmm. So if you started to bring order and, more importantly, hope, and be seen as someone that's actually helpful, that's not the reputation they wanted the Americans to have. 
So, you know, true story, right? Like we, we, real, we, we build this medical clinic. We found a doctor and a staff that were gonna run it. And he's like, yeah, but don't, don't come to the opening. And don't, I'm not, gonna, I'm not telling people you built it and you can't get any credit. Because if the Americans get credit for this medical clinic, it's gonna get blown up and they're gonna kill me and my family. Wow. Well, what's more important, getting credit for building the medical clinic or having a medical clinic that provides aid? So needless to say, we didn't go to the opening. <laughs> well, so then came the day that everything changed in your life. What happened? I was going to say I had a bad day. Um, <laughs> but apparently Jay says I can't. Um, so we were, we were part of a, um, an operation called Operation Together Forward 2. I'm not sharing anything that isn't public. Um, and it was the failure of that operation to re-secure Baghdad that led to General Petraeus's call for the surge in the fall of 06. So we were in this operation and basically it was a um, secure, hold, build. First step, go in there, the door knockers, secure the area. Then we were gonna hold it and look for bad guys and then we were going to build. Civil affairs was the build of secure, hold, build. And we were going to do it district by district in East Baghdad. Um, and there was a 24-hour you know, curfew for the first couple hours, and then there was nighttime curfews. But our role as civil affairs was to go in and do, get the hospitals restaffed, look at the school systems. My particular role was trash. So one of the lessons we learned about the errors of debathification, which is anyone that was a bathist was kicked out of government. Well, they were the administrators. They were right. They were the folks, the bureaucrats. And I mean that in a positive way. They're the ones that knew how all the systems work. So what communities would do is literally there'd be a giant pile of trash and every family would just dump their trash on a corner. And once, once every week or so, they'd pour gasoline on it and light it on fire. And then like just different or, you know, different communities were trying to secure themselves by putting barbed wire and logs in the middle of the street. So it was called area beautification, but I was the trash man. <laughs> I would literally go out, drive, put on a map where all these giant trash piles were. And on a daily basis, we hired, you know, three or four contractors, but there were three or 4,000 people out in Atamiya, which is the district in East Baghdad I was in, cleaning up trash. Well, someone had gone and started shooting at some of our contractors. This was a Thursday. And so we went out there, we raced out. Obviously the contractors were gone. <laughs> Didn't enjoy getting shot at. So we circle up and I'm thinking, well, you know, we're gonna A, protect them, B, report, give intelligence, whatever it was. So we drive out um, and we don't hear any, nothing's going on. And then this person runs up. We're like, what are you doing? Black Day Wu with this license plate. Call it up, call it across the Iraq. They locate this Day Wu because there's a, um, a curfew. They light it up, four dead bad guys. I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. Saturday, similar scenario. Important part of the story because they looked at what our tactics and procedures were on Thursday. Same thing, somebody's shooting in our contractors. We go out there but no one's talking, no one's helping, everyone's scowling at us. So I said, let's get out of here. Pull in all our security and then boom! Sniper round just below my body armor. I get blown to my feet, blown off my feet, blown on my back. And um, I guess at the time I thought that I had triggered a roadside bomb because I heard an explosion and I got thrown off my feet. And, and as I was flying backwards, I saw my boot staying on the ground. So I thought I'd been cut in half by a, a roadside bomb. And I was looking up at the street, uh, looking up at the sky, right? I didn't want to look down because I was going to bleed out. And I was like, fudge. Uh, and, you know, so then someone starts yelling, you know, sniper, sniper. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. You know, my buddy's calling out to me, you know, Tom, can you walk it all? Can you walk it all? I'm like, no, hold on, hold on. So I took a smoke grenade and I throw it and they grab me and they, they save me. 
Well, that was my story, right? So I was telling that story to somebody about my friend calling out to me, and I'm like, I throw smoke, like I participate in my own rescue. And so my friend hears the story, and, he, and I'm still at Walter Reed, and he calls me and goes, you idiot. I wasn't calling out to you. I was kneeling next to you. I'm trying to save your life, and you threw smoke in my face. <laughs> Shout out to Drew Corbin if this ever ends up on a video somewhere. He's a firefighter in Austin and he led, uh, he called in the nine line like a champ. They got me to an LZ, put me on a bird, had me at the, on the operating room table within the golden hour. So, yeah. So you still had your legs, but you had a sniper round basically through your pelvis, right? Yeah, it, well, it's a tumbling round, right? So it hit. It went over the iliac crest, shattered the right pelvis, tumbled through, shattered the sacrum, which is that triangle at the base of your spine, and then it shattered my right pelvis. Um, but again, fortunately, you know, it didn't compromise my hips. And um, as Jay pointed out this morning, you know, every day's a holiday, every meal's a feast. <laughs> um, you end up at Walter Reed. You're there, what, basically lying on your face or on your back, right? For, for how many months? Well, for the, I didn't, I wasn't able to stand up, um, for the first three months. So I got shot on September 9th and I stood up for the first time on December 22nd. The odd thing about my injury is I only ever had one surgery that day in at the Baghdad combat action surgical hospital because there was nothing to rod or pin into anything. So they just had to wait for my bones to re-knit. And it is super cool, like your body is very resilient. Like if there's a blood vessel, the bone when it's regrowing knows to grow around the nerve or around the vessel. But I had to wait for that process because it's the, the major weight bearing, you know, weight transfer and weight bearing element of your, of your um, skeletal system. So they had to wait till there was enough bone regrowth. And then they, you know, they, they let you stand up. But uh, has anyone here ever been long term in a hospital? Straight. So, so fundamentally, I was laying on, you know, I might go up periodically in a, in a wheelchair, but most of the day was this way. So what you don't know is that now your body thinks that's normal. So you can't just get up and start walking around one day. You have to go on a tilt board. And it looked like it was out of like a Frankenstein movie, right? Like you're strapped in <laughs> and they're like, all right, the first day we will do, you know, 20 degrees for 20 minutes. And then you come back and then we'll do, you know, 20 degrees for 10, you know, and then we'll get you up to 45. I'm like, well, like all soldiers, you're like, yeah, no, that's for suckers. Uh, I'll do 80 for 80 minutes first day, you know? So they, they tilt me up, you know, whatever it was, like not even like 30 degrees. <laughs> And you could, and the person standing next to me says, I could literally see the blood rushing out of your face. You look like Casper the ghost, like 60 seconds in. And I start, then I, then she goes, then, then you went green. And, and I was like, that's enough. You can put me down. Um, so whatever it was. So there's a couple days on the tilt board and then I was able to sort of get in a walker and, and, and start working on going from recovery to rehabilitation. And while you were in the hospital, your fairly new bride served you with divorce papers. Yeah, she, uh, not a good scene. So you'd heard, I, got, I went off to Vegas to get married, and I was like, wait, this isn't a good story. We had been engaged for over a year. Uh, she was a veteran, so she knew, you didn't, you know, me going back in the military, she didn't want to be the girlfriend of the fiance. So we went off to Vegas. It wasn't like an Elvis situation. So we go to Vegas, get married, and then I deploy. So there's no kids. Obviously, I was deployed or in the hospital. But yeah, she walked out of me when I was in a wheelchair. Um, yeah. I, it wasn't a healthy relationship, but um, bad timing. Bad timing. <laughs> but another, another gut punch. Um, so obviously, you recovered. You're here today and walking around. But. Um, when you got out of Walter Reed, you got back into business, right? And you want to tell us the, the highlights of that, that that led to Thundercat? So, yeah, and I, and I want to take 
credit for Thundercat, but I really, really can't. So when I had sold, when we had sold the company in 2005, I had signed a three-year earnout. Well, I now had been away for a year and a half, so I sort of agreed to finish that earnout with the the acquiring company. I was back in New York City, divorced, horrible limp, colostomy bag, um, really feeling like damaged goods, right? And and trying to figure out what does next look like. Um, and, and friends, some friends of mine approached me. They said, hey, we got this company. It, it's part of this other services company. We want to break it out. We could even call it Thundercat Technology. And my call sign in Baghdad was Thundercat 6. I'm like, tell me more about this company. So I, it's not like I had the idea. I was approached by my four co-founders. We looked at the idea. But from the time I talked to them to the time we incorporated was probably only six weeks. And then we stood up the company on April Fool's Day, 2008. So now every anniversary we celebrate, we're like, we're no fools, April 1st of whatever, whatever year, so. But, but you came out, so you must have been about 40, right? And, and had been badly injured. Yeah. What kept you going? That's interesting. Um, I just was happy, right? Like, and, and again, I, I, I was like jumping out of my seat this morning. Like I just wanted to hug Jay. Like, you, it's an attitude, I had to switch. You know, I'm not saying I didn't have dark days. I had some dark days, especially when my wife left me. Like those are dark days. But fundamentally, I was happy to be alive, excited to get back to work, excited to embrace whatever the new normal was. Um, at that point, the, the, the foundation had already started, and we continued doing humanitarian aid uh, for children in Iraq and Afghanistan. It wasn't actually until 2013 that we started helping the children of wounded warriors here in the U.S. Um, I, I, I don't know. Like, I think, you know, we talk, we've heard about grit today, and it's like, I wasn't 21. I wasn't 18. Like... I was 40, like I had had a good life, I had had experiences, and I knew that what I was capable of. Um, and so I just continued to just get after it and set new goals and, and just do my best to be successful in everything that I, in, in everything that I did. Um, yeah, I still have imposter syndrome sitting up on this stage, right? Like, but you get after it. You get after it. Because you could have gone the other direction. You could have, you know, drugs, drinking, whatever. You could have felt sorry for yourself, and you didn't do that. Almost, almost. So that's a great story. Because I, I feel bad for drug addicts, or at least veterans that have become drug addicts. Because I was taking Oxy, Oxycontin. And I remember I was home, because again, I, I, you know, I spent eight months in the hospital and then I did a full, I picked up an apartment in New York City that was two blocks from the VA so I could go to rehab for 90 minutes every day. And I did that for a full year. Um, and I was still in a great deal of pain. Um, and I still had a ton of Oxycontin. But with Oxy or any painkiller, you're supposed to take it before the pain starts. And I was heading out to a bar, and I didn't know if there'd be a seat for me to sit down. And I took the Oxy, and I was walking to the bar, and I said, wait a second. Did you take that because it goes good with vodka? Or did you take it because you needed it? And I didn't know the answer. And that was the last day I took Oxycontin. So, it, you know, I get it. I get it. But... Um, and I know we're running short on time, but so I go to the pain management clinic at the VA and there's these two doctors on those wheelie chairs, you know, and I'm figuring like I'm in a lot of pain, right? And I'm not taking the gabapentin, so I'm not taking the nerve pain medicine. I'm not taking the, the oxy. I'm looking for a solution. And uh, they're like, well, we'll give you this and we're going to give you this. And, and they were like all opioids and narcotics. And so I said, Doc, look at this face. Look at this face. And I go, no, closer. And they both get on their wheelie chairs and they're looking at my face. I go, you see this ugly face? 
No one's paying me for my good looks. I need to make decisions. I, and I can't do that when I'm high on opioids and narcotics. But like, it's not a pain management clinic. It's a drugstore. And so, no, I'm glad I didn't end up on that path as well, because I'm OCD. Like if I have a Dr. Pepper, I'll drink six Dr. Peppers. I'll get a bologna sandwich, I'll have a bologna sandwich every day. And then my wife's like, why is there rotting bologna in the fridge? Because I just then move on to whatever the next thing. So I, I do feel bad for those folks that get caught in that spiral. I did not get caught in that spiral. Well, not only did you um, recover yourself, but you've also done an amazing amount of work to help other veterans. And I, I want you to talk about that a little bit, the Tom Deerline Foundation and some of the things that, that you've done that, you know, uh, in affiliation with America's Warrior Partnership, uh, what's the goal of the foundation? What's your aim? What do you try to do? So the, the mission of the, the TD Foundation is we provide aid to the children of wounded warriors and fallen heroes. We help American veteran families that are in crisis. We're 100% volunteers, so we don't have staff, we don't have folks who, to, that, that do things. So we're part of a network, and they vet the cases and they bring them to us. Our friends from Code of Support are here. We do a ton of work with uh, the SOCOM Care Coalition, which Jim stood up. We work with America's Warrior Partnership, and even some of the bigger ones, like the Independence Fund, or we did a case with the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Our specialty is crisis, same day, next day payments. That's what we specialize in. We sort of, just like a lot of the people, we talk about gap analysis, we fill those gaps that are left by the VA or businesses or a local organization. And by the time people get to the TD Foundation through our partners, they're in crisis. Uh, and that's why we do that. But if there's children under 18 in the house, we can help. We do a lot of medical, we do a ton of preventing homelessness, utilities, car repairs. I was sitting at lunch with somebody just now. They're in the, they're in the network and they specialize in employment. So they're part of the AWP network and she was telling us of a case that she's referring back to AWP. A young girl that has to get to childcare, a mother that works at the home and a father that is in agriculture on the other side of town their car just broke down. They need a new transition. I'm like, that's what we do, right? Well, we've, been, we've bought a septic tank. We buy cranial helmets. We buy Chromebooks. Um, a little girl with hip dysplasia, the father found a $450 child seat so his daughter could sit up instead of laying flat back when the family was driving around. Like, there is no transition, transmission engines for vets.org. There is no, I need a septic tank to get certified in my new home.org, right? We've bought a septic tank. We buy beds, we buy furniture, but, but um, we do that through this network that brings us cases and we do direct funding that way. And if, um, if somebody in the audience wants to get a hold of you and can't, you know, run into you here at the uh, here at the uh, at the confab. I mean, if they want to get a hold of someone from the TD Foundation, how do they do that? It's uh, so I'll I'll do what Jim Lorraine did. My mobile phone is nine one seven two eight seven five nine six one. That's nine one seven two eight seven five nine. Six one, and it's just tdfoundation.org. So TD as in touchdown, foundation.org. We help the children of wounded warriors and fallen heroes, and we specialize in getting veteran families out of crisis with same day, next day payments. Got to be wounded. Got to be children under eighteen in the house. That's our mission. Whatever else fits under that, we will fund. I think uh, it ought to be pretty obvious uh, to you that this is an amazing man and a great patriot, a lover of this country and a, and a lover of veterans. 
Um, just the fact that you are willing to put on the uniform again after 12 years away and learn to do pull-ups again um, after, you know, 12 years and, and go back and serve your country. And, you know, from talking to Tom on and off stage, I know that he truly is motivated to help people. And um, for that, we salute you. Thanks very much, Tom. Really appreciate your time, Tom.